morning, church. Let's start the service with I Sing the Mighty Power of God. Well, good morning, Eagle Bend Community Church. What good news we received this week. With the leadership and fortitude of our administrator and nurse, Betty, and the quiet and firm leadership of Dr. Don Nuss, we met with the president of the board of directors and the general manager in the, about our return to the Antero Room. And we got the go-ahead. It will be on September 20th. Now, you will not have to return to the church in person if you're not comfortable or if you're susceptible 
you can, you can, we can only have a maximum of 50 people, so you will still be able to listen and watch the service and sermon via the website or on YouTube. I'm so thankful that the Lord has been with us for the last 15 years and the Holy Spirit has given us the power and the opportunity to have our worship here in, in, in Heritage Eagle Bend. We have touched so many people and we are so proud, so glad that, the, that God has allowed us to do this and has given us the power to do it. The sermon title for today is very appropriate. Are you excited about your future? And, this, and the scripture is from John 8, 1 to 11. Well, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. <clears throat> now early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came to him. And he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But, but what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote it on the ground. And those who heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus raised himself up, and saw the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? <clears throat> Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. You go and sin no more. And now the, may, now, now the, may, the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in, in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Are you an optimist? Are you a pessimist? Pessimist. When you look at a glass of water, is it half full or is it half empty? <clears throat> I like the idea that it's half full. When you face the trials and problems of life, do you face them strongly with hope, determination, and resolve to get through? Or do you give up in despair, hoping that things will just resolve themselves? Like, like in the Gone with the Wind, she said, I'll think about it tomorrow. Do you only see life with doors that are shut? Or do you like to take another look? Are there other opportunities? You know, when you look at a door that is shut in life, it doesn't mean that it's locked. It means that you must do something to open it. Perhaps that process and the use of your resources to open it will result in a better reward than just walking through an open door. You may need a new key, or you may need to find out what the combination is. Something should work for that closed door. <clears throat> if not, then on to the next door of opportunity, be it open or closed. It's been well said that the optimist is the person who sees an opportunity in every problem, and a pessimist sees a problem in every, in every opportunity. The optimist sees opportunity in problem, and the pessimist sees a problem in every opportunity. It was the optimist who invented the airplane and the pessimist who invented the parachute. <laughs> it takes all kinds to make a world and we need the optimist to keep us moving and the pessimist to keep us going in the right direction. Well, again, are you an optimist or a pessimist? We look at the biblical life, view of life, don't we? That's the way we look at life. The biblical view is realistic because it is founded on the truth that we live in a fallen world. Often very bad things happen to very good people. And again, we say, why? 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 Why did that happen? We live in a world where cars crash and good people die. Where little babies get AIDS. And people in authority sometimes mistreat children. In this world, lawyers can take bribes, pastors can violate others. 
Dictators sometimes make mistakes. Judges may be biased. And sports superstars very often do stupid things. Too often incompetent people are promised over those more qualified and good people lose their jobs for no reason. This has happened in our church, especially with our staff. Sometimes that good is seen quickly and sometimes it takes years to see clearly. Sometimes we never really fully understand why things work out the way they do. We do not have the big picture, God's picture. But this is as much as clear that God is at work in all the circumstances of life. The good and the bad that we go through, the positive and the negative, the happy and the sad, the up times, the down times, our sickness and in our health, when things are going well and things are falling apart, when we hit the jackpot and when we, our money runs out. He is always there, patiently working behind the scenes for our ultimate good. Remember that he is always working with you. Biblical optimism is not based upon man, but on God. Since it's based upon his unchanging character, it will test the st stand the test of time. My answer is that the Bible speaks directly to the point in question. Consider the words of Proverbs 17. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. I find it easy to believe that God loves the world in general, that he loves humans in general, and he created us, and he loves other people. But the notion that he loves me is much harder to grasp. He loves me, just me, my, my own specific self. The pessimist view is that how could he possibly love me? I am so imperfect. <clears throat> Some people even don't come to church because they don't think they're good enough. God loves those who are not good. All believe, as believers in God, we have a special relationship with him. That is the optimistic view. I'd like to show you a, a simple illustration of how God knows and loves you and the world could care, could care less. Now picture yourself in the antenna room like we used to be last March and before. And on the count of three, let's all shout out our name. One, two, three, Bruce, and then George, and John, John, and Tom, and Mary, and Ellen, and whatever. No, you would not understand one name, nor would you hear anybody's name, just a cacophony of sound, a lot of noise. But amidst that great noise that we would make, God knows your name. He hears your voice over the intelligible, unintelligible sound of the noise that we've made. And he hears us. He hears us individually, one of eight billion in this world. If that isn't optimistic, what is? Isn't that amazing that God knows us like nobody else? That's also the miracle of the gospel. That is what Jesus can do. He could take a life that's down and raise it up. He could take a life that's sinful and he can straighten it out. He can take a life that's broken. He can make it whole again. He can take a person who is an outcast and he can make them accepted. He can take a hated tax collector and make him one of the best citizens in the community. That's what Jesus Christ can do. Through Jesus, real change, real change is possible. Through, through Jesus, the habits of decades can be radically changed. Through Jesus' descriptive patterns of behavior can be changed and your life can be totally transformed. <clears throat> Through Jesus, even though you walk today with an old life, you can walk out with a new one. That is the promise of the gospel. Walking today in, with an old life that's been gone on for 70 or 80 years, where you can walk out of this life with a new one, transformed glorified body. That's why I am excited about my future and the future of all of you. That's why you ought to be excited about the future. Real change is possible. No, it's not possible. It is inevitable. It is promised. You don't have to stay the way you are. The future can start right now. 
the optimism of a Christian is possible because it is based upon the gospel of Jesus and not on our circumstances. The gospel is truth and real change is possible, even apparently hopeless situations. God works in your life and a process throughout your life from beginning to end. We just have to hang on to that resource. Everything has a purpose in life, everything. The fact that you don't always see it does not negate that fact. So be encouraged. God is at work in your life, especially in the hard times. The optimism of a Christian is possible because God's promises go beyond the, this life. That's the bottom line, isn't it? It's possible to face even the worst that life can give us if we know what's, ha what's going to happen at the end. The promises of God go beyond the grave and on and on and on for eternity. You know, in heaven there's no more cancer, no more sickness, no more Alzheimer's, no more COPD, no more heart disease, no more Parkinson's, no more dystrophy. In heaven there's oh, only the radiance and joy of seeing Jesus Christ, the Heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit face to face. The best is yet to come. Aren't you excited about the future? If you're a child of God, you ought to be excited. Jesus Christ has already taken care of your past, your present, and your future. He's taken care of your past by forgiving you your sins. He's taken care of your present when he said, I will never leave you. He's taken care of the future when he says in John 14, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would, not have, to I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you, but if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's a huge statement, that where Jesus is, there you may be. Your past is forgiven, your present is secure, and your future is guaranteed. For the child of God, the best is always yet to come. The only question left is, do you know him? Do you know Jesus? Where is your hope for the future? Do you know Jesus Christ? Have you put your trust in him? He's good for, for yesterday. He's good for today. He's good for all the tomorrows yet to come. Whatever happens to you, you'll be in good hands if you're in his hands because his hands rule the world. Put your life in, your, in his hands. You'll never be disappointed. Listen to Psalm 34, verse 5. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces will never be put to shame. We thank God for eternal promises. We thank you for a hope that does not diminish with the passing of time. We thank you for giving us a future that even death cannot destroy. May we believe that in Jesus Christ we have that need yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. We thank you for replacing the perishing hope of this world with a hope that is eternal. On this Sunday and every day, we should be excited about our future. We are filled with great anticipation about our future. We give thanks because we are servants, priests, and believers of the great King of Kings, who is King over all dominions, presidents, dictators, the Lord of Lord. No lords are greater than he. He is the ultimate King of Kings, the Great One, the Alpha and Omega, the Great I Am. We praise his name. Let us confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He preached to the dead. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let us receive communion. In the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room for the Passover dinner. He took the bread and he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Eat all of it in remembrance of me. After, he finished, after they finished eating, he took the cup. He blessed it and said, This is my blood which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Drink all of it in remembrance of me. And now let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's close the service with Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.